So welcome everyone. And uh, I'm not sure where you are pulling in from, but here where I am, it's evening. So let's just say good evening. My name is Peter Ripstrasen, um, and I believe it's in my Zoom um, setting there. Uh, this is Eve and Chandra's meeting. You are in the correct meeting. I just saw in chat. I have been invited by Lopan Chandra Easton to be here and to present Feeding Your Demons uh, to this evening. I'm assuming she um, she couldn't be here, and but she was inviting me. And I've been here once before presenting on Feeding Your Demons uh, I am a colleague of Lopanchandra Easton's, uh, and we work closely together at Paramandala Buddhist Retreat Center in southwestern Colorado with Lama Sultram Alioni. So that's um, how I ended up being here. And I, you know, I am a longtime practitioner and teacher of the Feeding Your Demons modality, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so by way of introduction, maybe I'll say a little bit more about myself. So I mentioned my connection to the Tara Mandala Retreat Center. It was founded by Lama Sultram Leone. This modality of feeding your demons is also founded by Lama Sultram Leone. And those of you familiar with mm. Vajrayana Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism will uh, know the Ch practice, C-H-O-D, umlaut on the O, and uh, that practice was formalized by the 11th century Dakini, Machik Labdran, and uh, it is basically, the practice of Cher is about cutting through ego clinging, and so Lama Sultra Malioni took the basic points of departure, the basic principles of the Cher practice of cutting through ego clinging, and developed a process called Feeding Your Demons, which is based on that idea of Cher, but also contains some elements of Western psychology, such as Gestalt and Jungian psychology, and came up with this process that is um, that I will lead you through and demonstrate. Um, that is a process to work with obstacles that come up. It's a very direct, skillful means of working with various obstacles that may arise. And um, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Feeding Your Demons because Eve Ekman, as you might know, and Lopin Chandra spearheaded a study on uh, Feeding Your Demons with Philippe Golden. Uh, that was just recently published. Both the qualitative and quantitative aspects of that study was finally published um, and, uh, you know, demonstrated some real results with people uh, suffering from uh, depression, uh, addiction and so forth. So I've been working with Lopin Chandra for many years, uh, decades probably now, uh, and we are uh, both part of Tara Mandla and part of the senior teacher core at Tara Mandla. And so this, this is how I ended up being here tonight. Um, so For those of you, I know there are some of you at least who do not know what feeding your demons is because I, as I came on, I heard it being explained to someone. So, uh, and then some of you, I'm sure, have probably done this before and um, uh, may be familiar with the process. But if this is your first time, uh, let me just say a few things about it. So, I mentioned the origin of feeding your demons from that 11th century practice of Cha. Um, and it really is, uh, I think the core, at the core of it, the invitation is feeding, not fighting. Um, the other way, so in other words, instead of pushing away or rejecting our demons or those things uh, that, uh, you know, our afflictions or those things that we don't like about ourselves, this is an invitation to turn towards and actually open to and then engage with those neurotic aspects of ourselves or of our personalities or those obsessive qualities or those things that challenge us in daily life, uh, mostly psychological. It could also be physical ailments, 
could also be difficulty in relationship, for example, or anything that is that is really taking your energy at the moment, something that that you are preoccupied with and that you're struggling with or obsessed with. And this is a good um, and you can you you may start thinking about what you might want to work with tonight, because in a moment, I'll invite you to think about something you'll work with. And then um, uh, I'll lead you through this process so you can have a direct experience. And then afterwards, we can talk about it a little bit. You may have questions, and I can say a few words about feeding your demons and some of the principles behind it, and maybe a few things about Machik Labjan, who is really the progenitor of Cha, and that's also of this of this um, of this process. But really, really at its core, it's about you can say it's feeding, not fighting, but it's not avoiding. It's almost more profound to me. It's we are so programmed, so conditioned to reflexively avoid or try to avoid that which we don't like. We rebel against it, we resist it, but so often we have these very subtle techniques of avoidance. We just want to, especially you know, in, in our personal life, we want to avoid aspects that are you know awkward and difficult for us feels uncomfortable, feels like suffering, it's unpleasant. So we want to avoid that. But also in a larger cultural sense, things that are going on in the culture, you know, that we just want to run for the hills. And this, this not only the feeding your demons work, but really Machik's teachings really invite us to turn towards and to open to basically abide into in the vast nature of our minds, but not to the exclusion of reality, not to the exclusion of anything that's going on in that reality around us, not not by avoiding and carving out some some you know romantic luminous space of meditative absorption that actually translates into subtle avoidance of what is. So that's basically at the core of her teachings. And this practice is, you know, along those lines, it's really saying, you know, it's a little bit like um, taking the bull by the horns and saying, okay, what is this thing that has been bugging me? What, or maybe this, this, these issues in my personality that I've been going to therapy for, for so many years and so forth. But how do I really engage with this? Um, and how do I accept it, first of all, right? Because in order to not avoid, we have to accept that we are having those experiences or those emotions. So this is that invitation. Before I go further, um, let me say something more specific about this process, just, just the logistics of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm open for questions just regarding the process, and then we'll go through it. So I am going to ask you, and someone explained it um, in the beginning, in the background, but basically I'm going to ask you to sit up your space so that you have two chairs facing each other. And in other words, you will not be facing the screen. And I, you know, I know this is a, you know, a little logistical setup, but I do encourage you to follow uh, along because you know, here you are and, uh, and, and I think, it's beneficial. So you will set up two chairs that face each other. So the one chair will be like this, you'll be sitting like this. And then I will invite you at some point to switch places and you'll physically switch places to the other seat and you'll face as if you are facing yourself like this and not relate to the screen. And um, in fact, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes during the process. and. Um, and then I'll lead you through this feeding your demons process. Uh, and uh, it's a five-step process. You choose something to work with. And it's, it's a simple visualization process, a script where you will have a conversation with yourself. And I will just give you the prompt for that conversation. And, uh, and then see if there's some possible transformation that takes place. I would say... I would, you know, again, encourage you to, to do this because just listening to the process is not going to be nearly as interesting as actually going through it. 
So I do encourage you to actually, um, you know, you can always bail if it's not working for you. I'm just giving a few more minutes to get set up. So you'll want two seats facing each other. You're going to have a conversation with your virtual self, basically, and switch back and forth just a few times. And you'll see, it'll make more sense. If you've never done this, you'll, it'll make more sense once we do the process. Okay. more time. Okay, so as we go through the process, I will I will invite you to bring to mind certain things and to imagine uh, to to use your imagination to project the aspect that you're working with to project it out for it to manifest on the chair in front of you. And what I would like to encourage you is to just let whatever comes up, let it come up. Don't overthink it, you know, just trust. First, first image, best image, kind of. Um, and, you know, sometimes our, our everyday rational mind may have a tendency to comment or doubt what's going on, but just, just go along with what appears. Um, even if you feel like you are creating some of it or using your imagination to, to manufacture it, that's fine. Okay, so as I said, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes during the process as much as possible. And we'll start by just taking some deep relaxation breaths. And breathe into any physical tension you may be holding in your body. And then hooking that tension with the breath, release the tension with the out breath. And now breathe into any emotional tension you may be experiencing. Notice where you're holding that emotional tension in your body. And then using the breath to dissolve that tension and let it ride out on the out breath and relax. The idea is just to really come present and relax and let go of any preoccupations and tension. Now breathe into any mental tension, thoughts or worries. Notice where you're holding that tension in your body and then hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. And now generate the heartfelt motivation to practice not only for your own benefit, but to do this practice for the benefit of all beings.
And I'd like to invite you to bring to mind that which you would like to work with tonight. As I had said before, something that you are struggling or that with or that is up for you in your life right now. It's something that you can really feel into. Bring that to mind, perhaps remembering a particular time or incident when it came up strongly for you. And then as you're holding this in your mind, mentally scan your body and see if you can locate where in your body you are holding this energy, this demon, this obstacle most strongly. So if you had to find this in your body, where in your body do you hold this most strongly? Now, as you focus on this place in your body or these places in your body, imagine it has a shape, this feeling in your body. What is that shape? And now noticing if it had a color, what color would it be? What is its texture or consistency? What is its temperature? Now intensify the awareness of this energy in your body and bring your full attention to it. And now allow the shape with its color, consistency, temperature, allow the shape to move out of your body and to become personified in front of you as a being with a face, eyes, limbs, and so on. So it's moving out of your body and taking shape on the seat across from you, in front of you, preferably as some kind of being. If it is an inanimate being that appears, then you may invite it to become a being with arms and legs and so on. And now notice the characteristics of this being in front of you. What size is it? What is its color? What is the surface of its body like? What is its density? If it had a smell, what smell would be associated with this being? Does it have a gender? Can you look in its eyes and see what is the look in its eyes? What is its emotional state? And what is its character or its personality like? Now notice something about this being that you didn't see before. 
something that you hadn't seen. So we're going to ask this entity some questions, this being, and just ask the questions. You can ask it out loud, but don't wait for the answers at this point. Just ask the questions. The first question is, what do you want? What do you want? The second question, what do you really need? What do you really need? The third question, how will you feel when you get what you really need? How will you feel when you get what you really need? Now, as soon as you've asked the questions, I want to invite you to switch places, physically switch places, keeping your eyes closed as much as possible and face your current seat. Take a moment to settle into this being's body. And you can feel free to adopt a posture or make a gesture that this entity, this being might make if it is helpful. Or otherwise, just sit or stand facing your normal self. How does it feel to be in the being body? How does your normal self look from the demon's point of view? Now bringing your attention back as yourself, as this, bringing your attention back to yourself as the being, you're going to answer the questions that have been asked. You're imagining that you're speaking as this being. The first answer is, what I want is, what I want is, What do you want? What I want is. The second answer, what I really need, what I really need here. This is the need underneath the want, the deeper need. What I really need is. What do you really need? What I really need is. The third answer. When I get what I really need, I will feel when I get what I really need, I will feel, imagine getting, receiving what you really need, even if it may seem improbable, imagine getting what you really need. How does that feel? 
when I get what I really need, I will feel What does that feel like? Make sure you get to a feeling here. When I get what I really need, I will feel Take note of this final answer, this feeling. Remember this feeling as we will use it again a little later on. So when you're ready, I want to invite you to switch back to your original seat. As you're switching back, take a moment to settle back into your own body. See the demon in front of you, the being. See the being in front of you. And now remembering that feeling that the demon had said that it would feel if it got what it really needed. Evoking that feeling in your body and feel, feel that feeling spread through your entire body. So you're re-evoking that feeling that the demon had said it would, it would have if it got what it needed. You're evoking that feeling in your body. And then dissolve your body into a kind of a nectar that has the quality of this feeling. So you're feeling that feeling and then dissolving your body into a nectar that has the quality of that feeling. Notice the color of this nectar. And then you start feeding the demon, start feeding this being with this nectar. See the nectar go out from you and see this being take in the nectar in whichever way it wants to, but see it actually ingest this nectar. And you may imagine you have an infinite supply of this nectar flowing from you to the demon. And you're going to nurture the demon to its complete satisfaction. So you're going to feed it until it is completely satisfied. Take your time. Keep feeding it. So you're offering this nectar to the demon, it's going out from you. So you continue feeding it until it is completely satisfied. Make sure the demon is completely satisfied. Feed it to its complete satisfaction. If you're not sure whether the demon is satisfied, offer you may offer more to make sure that it is completely satisfied and fully nurtured. So at this point, if your demon is not completely satisfied, you may imagine what it would look like if it was completely satisfied.
So once the demon is completely satisfied, notice if there is still a being there. Depending on your process, the being may have completely dissolved, or there may still be a being there. If there is a being present, ask it if it is your ally. If it says yes, if the being that remains is your ally, you will continue working with that being. If it says no, or there are no being present, it has completely dissolved, then you may invite a third being, being, an ally, to appear. So if there's a being present, you may ask it if it's your ally. If it's not your ally, or if there's no being present, you may invite an ally to appear. If it is your ally, you'll continue working with the being in front of you. So either way, you should have an ally in front of you, either the transformed being or an ally that you have invited. And so your attention is now on this ally, noticing the characteristics of this ally in front of you. Again, if it's an inanimate being, then you may imagine what it would look like if it were personified as a being with arms and a head and eyes and so forth. And now again, notice what size is this ally? What color? What is the surface of its body? What is its density? If it had a smell, what smell would be associated with the ally? Does it have a gender? What is the look in its eyes? What is its emotional state? And what is its character or its personality like? And now again, notice something about this ally that you have not noticed before. So it's something you didn't see before. Now we're now going to ask some questions of the ally. And just like before, don't wait for the answers. Just ask the questions out clearly. The first question is, how will you help me? How will you help me? How will you protect me? How will you protect me? What? pledge do you make to me? What pledge do you make to me? And finally, how can I access you? How can I access you? As soon as you've asked those questions, I'd like to invite you to switch places again and to become the ally. So you're switching, becoming the ally settling into the ally's body. Again, feel free to adopt the posture or make a gesture if that's helpful. And now notice, how does it feel to be in the ally's body? What does that feel like? And look across at yourself and see what do you look like from the ally's perspective.
So now, we're going to answer the questions that have been asked. The first answer is, I will help you by, I will help you by, I will protect you by, I pledge to you that I will, I pledge to you that I will and finally you can access me by, you can access me by As soon as you have received these answers, ask the ally, is there anything else you'd like to share that may be helpful in working with this issue? Is there anything else you'd like to share that may be helpful? Anything else? So when you're ready, you complete, I'd like to invite you to return to your original seat. And again, take a moment to settle back into your own body. See the ally in front of you. And now imagine the ally dissolves into light and let that light integrate into your body. So look into the eyes of the ally and feel its energy pouring into your body. As you feel the energy of the ally coming into your body, you can feel it spreading all the way through your body, down to the soles of your feet, to your fingertips. And notice how this feels to integrate with this energy of the ally. Now imagine that the ally completely dissolves into light. Notice the color of this light. And then feel this light dissolving into you, integrating this luminosity into every cell of your body.
And take note of the feeling again of this integrated in energy of the ally in your body. And now you with this integrated energy of the ally, dissolve and just rest. Just rest in the state that is present after the dissolution. Nothing to do, just rest. Now gradually come back to your body, recalling the feeling of the energy of the ally in your body. And then as you open your eyes, maintain that feeling of the energy of the ally in your body. So this concludes the feeding of demons process. When you're ready, when you're on time, take your seat. again in front of the screen. Thank you very much for participating and for um, allowing me to lead you through this. And I truly hope it was helpful, at least in some small way or interesting, and perhaps insightful. So, I would be, I'd be curious to, to hear maybe some comments, questions, experiences you may feel um, ready to share. Just how was this for you? Or you know, did it work for you? Or do you have questions about some aspects of the process or your experience? Are you able to unmute? So that yes, you are. Hi, Peter. I'm here in the room. I don't. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. 
Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for that. That was really wonderful. And thank you for being here and stepping in for Chandra and Tara Mandala. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, one thing that came up for me, I feel like I, um, I said it's sort of a big demon. Um, and I'm not sure that it was totally satisfied. I still feel like there's like some remnants left over. And I guess I was just curious what your advice is on like what to do when that happens. Yeah, you know that, um, well, first of all, uh, it's something you can you can work with again. You know, if you feel like um, that it would have been more ideal if it was completely satisfied, uh, then it it you know this is a process that you can do for yourself. So the script is available, and I can share it. Also, this you can follow this process and just lead yourself through it. So I would say it would be good maybe to do another process with with that same either the same issue and this let a demon arise and see it may actually look different or you could also imagine the same entity the same being and then go back to that process of feeding uh, you know go through the process to that point and then make sure that it's fed to complete satisfaction um at this point i would that's what i would recommend in the process itself we have this little technique where you know if if uh if the you know first of all you would take as much time as you need and so when when we're leading a group i don't know exactly where everyone is so i'm just using my best judgment so if i was working with you individually uh you would be telling me the demon is not satisfied and i would encourage you to just keep feeding and maybe try different ways of feeding it uh sometimes the fact that it doesn't want to be satisfied has something to do with the nature of the issue that you're working with and it may you know and you you you'll probably know you know if that resonates um it, it may be something that is intractable in a specific way where it you know it refuses to be satisfied and that is sort of the nature of this demon um but i would encourage you to try and get it to to at least in each process to be completely satisfied um what happened for you at that point when it wasn't satisfied? Did you did it transform into an ally, or did you invite an ally, or how did it go from there? I had to invite one. I just sort of let it be partially okay, and I thought that was good enough. And then um, I invited an, an ally and went from there. Okay, great. And was the was the process good with the ally? Was that helpful? Did it feel... Yes, that was really helpful. Yeah. Okay. So what you could also do is when you, if you do this process again and you go back to that demon, you can you can actually call on this ally to help you, to assist you, to feed the demon to complete satisfaction. Okay. I don't option. think I've done that before. Yeah. And specifically, if it was a powerful ally or a helpful ally, then, you know, you it's sort of like calling in backup in a way um and it's all <laughs> aspects of yourself of course but sure. um you know it's it 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 may um it, it it will probably help to get this demon to a place of complete satisfaction because if the demon if it gets completely satisfied there's often that sort of final transformation that is really the resolution of the, mm. of the issue yeah all right thank you okay any other Comments, questions, experiences? Yeah, there's a, another one here in the room. Hello, Peter. Thank you very much for that experience. My name is Ulysses, and the question that I have is, I was really surprised to, you know, when I asked the questions, um, the response that I got was, it was in my voice. And it was, it was, it kind of started me. It was like a very, um, it was a very intense lag. And I was like, well, that's not me, but a very, very defiant, you know? And so I was wondering, um, <laughs> is it, is it truly the self that is speaking or is it almost like, you know, yes, you know, this, this, this other being, I guess, you know, 
I mean, everything about it, it was in my voice, the tone, and I was, and I was just, just kind of like, I was very surprised about that. So are, just to make sure I get you right, was it in your voice or not in your voice? Well, I, you know, I did the exercise quietly, so, you know, I was thinking it, and, you know, and and when I asked those questions in my in my mind, um, in my voice, the response that I got was very different. It was, it, it was in my voice, so that's and I was very surprised. You know, I thought it was going to be my voice talking back to me, but <laughs> so uh, it actually gave me chills. I was like, "Whoa, this is interesting." Uh, so that's I'm wondering if if that yeah. has ever come up, or you know. Yeah, it's 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 I can I can I, I can see how that could be, you know, somewhat um alarming, you know. Um so the the the, the it does not uh it does not uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't happen that it speaks with a different voice. That does happen, but it's it's it doesn't happen so much that uh that it seems like a different entity altogether. In other words, the, the very much the view behind this work or the point of departure is that these are aspects of ourselves, um, you know, that we, so for example, the demon is, uh, you know, an aspect of our ego makeup or our personality that we habitually repress maybe, uh, or that we, you know, like a neurotic aspect of ourselves that we are in a particular relationship or posture, and we have a specific posture to our issues or our problems. We have this relationship because it's very much an integral part of our ego, you know. Uh, and so um, this process is designed to sort of give through this scripted conversation and through externalizing intentionally externalizing this aspect of ourselves we we get to to have a conversation and to actually see it from a different angle and to to hear its voice so to speak but it's all very much from the point of view that these are aspects of ourselves and not so much you know other entities that are expressing through us um other uh, beings that are expressing through us so um so that's that's the context in which we use it and then people are also often surprised and some of you may have had that experience that how the ally is really a voice of wisdom our own voice of wisdom that we by virtue of, ex of externalizing it we give it this platform and then it speaks to us and it's really our own wisdom but it's not something it's not necessarily advice that we would have come up with if we had just sort of contemplated it um so that's the power of the process but I would say we generally don't present it in a way of as other entities that are speaking through us and so forth. Um, so is, it, it, it feels to me like that's maybe what it feels felt like to you. It was a sort of a surprising how different that voice is. Is, is, is. is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly, you know, what it felt like. And, and it's interesting because when you said describe the entity, you know, I saw myself, but just a very cold version of myself, right? But it wasn't it was a human form um and so that didn't surprise me surprised me as much because i was like oh it's just me and you know in a colder form and uh when you asked about you know what it feels like it's just heavy and you know um taste it was like a metallic taste but the most surprising thing was the voice i was just mm. like wow this that's not me <laughs> but yeah. yes uh, but thank you for that thank you for the experience it was it was, it was great yeah, no, great. I it sounds like just from from the additional information there, it sounds like you actually had a you know a powerful experience in the sense that it really worked. You know, where you could even the taste and and so forth. It's it's so it's often so surprising how you know what you just articulated how different this these aspects could seem. You know. And what it says, it's not something that we would have anticipated. So I would say surprise is probably the number one sort of uh, 
feedback, num you know, number one feeling or emotion that comes up in relation to this, this process, you know, and, but hopefully it's helpful because we see it from that different point of view. And then we, we, it gives us a different angle to understand that aspect of ourselves and how to integrate it or how to work with it. Any, any other comments or thoughts? I had a really powerful experience. I just want to thank you. I've been, I've noticed a process just in my daily living of observation that from time to time, there's uh, this discursive voice, or there's maybe sort of a feeling impulse, and then it leads to a story, which leads to feeling anxious. And I was able to I was able to, it's hard to describe that process, but I'm constantly whipping, I'm constantly dredging up fear and anxiety and, you know, noticing it and making friends with it and being with it. And I was able to, through this process, see that my demon is, was there, hey, I'm there to protect you. Because when I was a child, I was surprised constantly when I was bullied or betrayed or you know, just surprised, you know, surprised at bad treatment. So it's, it does that. So I'm not surprised. That's the process that um, I'll be content, you know, that little content person that lives in a heart, very heartfelt, sweet person. And, and then all of a sudden here's like disaster planning and, or, you know, these, you know, I've just, that it's hard to describe, but I don't want to take up too much time, but that's what that was for. And so I got to hear my demon saying, Hey, I'm there to protect you and you need me. And, and um, and then it's the wonderful ally of the Dharma. So anyway, just thank you so much for this. Mm, you're so welcome. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, um, I saw that you you were very, uh, you know, the, it seemed like you were very much embodied, and the demon was really talking to you and back and forth, and and it seemed a very engaged process. So I'm very happy to hear that it was helpful. Yeah. And in, in by the way, so you mentioned the power, this powerful ally is um you you if if you had that experience and you had a really powerful and beautiful ally, um you can trust that you reintegrated that ally and that that wisdom is in you, uh, and you don't have to grasp or wonder how you're gonna reaccess that. But however, you can also uh you know bring to mind this ally or make a an, image or an effigy of this ally to remind you, you know, uh, if it was something specific, you could get a picture of, you know, something, what it, what it was, if it was, you know, whatever, it, in whatever form it appeared, to remind you and put it on your bathroom mirror or on your refrigerator or, you know, so that um, you can bring it to mind when you feel afflicted. And you, specifically when you feel afflicted in this specific way that, you know, this demon that you were working with. Um, you know, thank you. I've kind of been doing that. Um, there's a practice that I do from Tondok Tolku and um, of just visualizing the healing light, just the healing light energy. So when I get all wrapped up and I'm just, you know, anxious and upset, I can stop and be still. And, and then I love uh, the image of Avalokiteshvara, so that beautiful loving energy that's everywhere, the big everything that's always with us, empty and but everything and inner being. So thank you. Yeah, you don't can't see my home, but there are there are pictures everywhere. Anyway, thank you for that reminder. Yes, and maybe I'll have absolutely. some new ones too now. But it did it felt wonderful to integrate that and remind me that it's always there. And it's just like that forgetting again and again and again to come back to it, just to hopefully yeah. remember. And that's what the, I was saying, you know, gonna remember again and again. It's always there. Thank you. You know, the beauty of the Dharma and of nature of mind is that it's okay to forget. We realize when we remember, we tap into basic okayness. And that basic okayness from that place, we know that the entire journey is actually good even though there's a lot of suffering and there's a lot of affliction. But in those times when we can actually relax and contact and connect with the nature of our minds, uh, the ground of being, the, the, the luminosity of all of, of, of our you know, 
existence that is that is basically what what is radiating through us expressing through us right if we contact with that and we relax back into that nature from we we see that the entire dualistic experience that we're having is 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 all actually okay and so when we remember then we 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 that that makes even the forgetting the parts where we're forgetting also part of the journey and so yes we we have to keep remembering but it's also part of the journey to keep forgetting you know and that's okay any other comments or experiences yeah i'll i'll offer something <laughs> Um, thank you, Peter, for the guidance. Um, my name is Stevie. Um, and before I forget the forgetting, I'm uh, visiting San Francisco. I used to live here, but I forgot about how beautiful the city is. And today I was able to like walk around it. And I was, the forgetting is great because when you remember, it's that much better. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, it was interesting. My demon, I just wanted to volunteer this information for you. I'm not sure if sure. Uh, this is helpful, but um, my it was interesting. My my demon had very specific characteristics, and then it like transformed into my uh, ally. Um, you know, so it sort of was. It, there was this like um, uh, this shape shifting that happened, right? And that was really interesting. It was a very powerful practice. Thank you so much. And uh, one thing to that I think, uh, you know, myself or the, the practice itself helped with was that like the, the my ally has a name that I didn't know of before this. And uh, that's nice because that's like a referral. It's sort of like a now I have a marker of like what that is. So that you were saying printing out a an image or something and for me it was a name and, mm. and maybe that's because i've gone by many names in this life and um this is just another one that's inside and anyways thank you so much oh great that, that was great thank you steve that, um uh I, I i love that about the name um yeah you can call it by its name now this that aspect you can you can invoke it you know um by name that's wonderful and um the transformation of the way the demon transforms into the ally is 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 kind of the typical of this work, and it's really the the tantric principle itself, and that's the whole idea. Is that energy is expressing, and from our dualistic or relative point of view, it may seem like negativity, or it may see, or it might manifest in positivity, but the the seed, the core of the energy is the same. It's actually enlightened intent. And, and that's how our demons actually are just flip sides of our allies. They relate it, you know, hope and fear. The, the things that we, we when, when we, we hope for something, and we aspire to say, so we're hoping that something will go a certain way. And the, that close to it is the fear that it's not going to happen or that it's going to go wrong. We are hoping for the best. We hope to stay healthy and we fear to be, become diseased. And those two are completely related. And in Tantra, our own demons, you know, Machid Labjan says, tenderly surround yourself with your demons. Like they, they, because they are your allies, they, our neuroses are, can be gateways to accessing wisdom. So this is really the essence of the practice. So I just wanted to, I thought it was so brilliant that you said that. And that's really the idea is the transformation of our own demons transform. They actually are greatest ally because there's tremendous energy there. Um, you know, that our, you know, uh, Almost none of our personality traits or aspects. There are certain things we love about ourselves, uh, and there are certain things we don't like about ourselves. But there's there's no specific thing that is always right or always perfect. 
You know, even, even our best personality traits can manifest in a neurotic way and vice versa. So, you know, it's seeing the relationship between our shadow and light in a way. And a big part of it, I said in the beginning, I spoke about radical non, excuse me, radical non-avoidance. But this, this here bridges into radical self-acceptance, which connects to radical self-love and radical compassion, self-compassion. We, we, we all have these neurotic behaviors and aspects and afflictions, shadow aspects. And we all have these beautiful, you know, hearts and, and aspects of our personality. But together, it makes up the brilliance of our being and the manifestation. It's not like one part of us is bad and one part is good. It's just from our perspective, the complexity of, du of, of, of duality just seems like it's bad, and then it becomes painful. It's and it, it feels like suffering. I mean, to really step back, and this 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 connects back to Ulysses' this comment about the voice. The, the 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 original point of departure, what Machik Lotrin, who was the originator of this work, really talks about is cutting through ego clinging right so what is this uh this is the in dharma buddhism right there's there is the basic split that's the original original kind of let's call it a original predicament that the buddha spoke of the original predicament is that unified all aware interconnected awareness has the ability, is aware, intrinsically aware, and therefore has the, has the ability to be self-aware. And as soon as awareness becomes aware of itself, this phenomenon of splitting off and experiencing itself as a self, separate from the awareness out of which it is born, that's the basic split. That's the birth of the self, the birth of the ego. And then the non-recognition of the ground out of which this ego arose gives rise to all our neuroses, every single one of them, all our fears, all our hopes. The hope is to get back to the ground. The fear is being forever alone and isolated and scared, vulnerable. And this mechanism, this is what the ego builds around. And that becomes the self. And the self is, is as much constructed of our neurotic aspects than what it is of any kind of wisdom aspect. Because all of it is a result of thinking that we exist separately from everything else and trying to deal with that reality on a daily basis. So the reason why I was referencing Ulysses here is because actually in this, there is no other, ultimately. Really, Buddhism is about relaxing and abiding and cutting through the self so that you actually have a direct experience of the ground of being, the awareness that you were born out and is being born out of in every second, every moment. And to relax all of this holding, all of this clinging of the self, to relax and practice, to open and relax and to surrender, to accept, and to rest back into your very nature and just abide. And so starting the ultimate remedy is to just rest in your nature, the way things are. And in that space, all potential affliction or delusion self liberates. There's nothing to stick to. There's no other. There's, there's no duality. So it, it, it 
radiates out of the ground, it arises and it liberates. You know, like traditionally, they do, like a bird flying, like the trail, like not leaving a trail when a bird flies through the sky. It liberates. There's no keynote. That's the ultimate practice of getting through ego clinging. But we're not always in that place where we can just relax into the nature of mind, you know. <laughs> so we live in this life and things are going on and we confronted with things and we do have a dualistic experience. And so that is where these relative practices like cha or feeding your demons come in. So actually she talks about three levels to get a little technical, but I think it's interesting. But the, the ultimate level of practice is just abiding in the absolute nature of mind. And this cannot be faked. Because that if you fake it, that's called escaping into the absolute or, you know, um, you, you're, you can't fake it. You're either actually resting in the nature of mind or you're not. Um, and then you just, then you suffer. And there's neuroses. But that's the ultimate level of practice. But we're not always at a place where we can abide easefully with everything that's going on. And by the way, this is not some other space. This includes all of phenomena, the totality of phenomena, just as it is, because it's the rising out of the ground. This is the manifestation of the Dharmakaya. So as it arises, we just rest, and there's no conflict. There's no grasping. There's no rejecting. There's just that that's ultimate liberation. The second level, for what she says, middling practitioners, this is for superior practitioners, middling practitioners, is you knowing all of this that I said, you're realizing this, and you, you're in a dualistic kind of situation. And as something arises, let's say like a trigger or neurotic behavior or something, you know, that wants to go into fear or judgment or, you know, split off. As it arises, you recognize that you are falling into dualistic subject object cognition to be technical, be less technical, you are falling into neuroses. You recognize, you realize that like in a dream, that the dream image is no other than my own mind. And in realizing that you cut through and it, and it liberates and you rest. That's, that's the second level. The third level is what we just did, feeding your demons or chur. That is like actually saying this issue I can tell myself I shouldn't be thinking about this. I can tell myself I'm not affected this. But the truth of it is I'm totally preoccupied with this on a daily basis. I wake up at 3 a.m. and what's happening? This issue is coming up in my mind. And you know, no matter what I do, what, what remedy I apply, it's, it's I'm just this neurotic thinking or this obsessive quality is there because it's the nature of our mind with the small m. Then we say, no, it doesn't help to tell myself, just abide in the nature of mind, just meditate. Because it's even in my meditation, this thing comes up. Or let's make it even more serious. It's just finding out that I have a serious disease. Just, you know, coming at the end of a, of a long marriage and, and going through divorce. Um, difficult relationship issues, uh, you know, losing your job, the major, major things that you cannot just be like, oh, it's not a big deal. So then how do you deal with it? That's where this path of non-avoidance comes in. And you say, you don't try and just turn away or ignore it or cut through it. You actually turn towards and you open to it. But here's, this is important. How do you open to it? It's not your small self turning into this huge thing and facing the demons and fighting it and so forth. No, it's using your practice of meditation, of contemplation, and relaxing into the vast view with an, not to the exclusion of anything, including the neurotic aspects, the difficulty and so forth. But you're holding that difficulty with the, within the vast view. And that vast view, it's like the ocean becoming aware of itself. Everything in the, when the ocean becomes aware of itself, doesn't mean the waves stop waving. The, the waves don't stop crashing on the beach. The sharks don't stop hunting the seals. All of that still continues. But there's no problem because the ocean is resting in its oceanness. So when you have that view, that's what we cultivate in meditation. We cultivate the big, the vast view. 
And when we then look at our challenges, they don't become nothing or go away, but there's a vaster landscape relative to our, our view. It's less claustrophobic, less impactful. But in some times when it is very impactful and, less, and really claustrophobic, then we use a technique like the chair practice. The traditional chair practice is a very shamanic practice with drum and bell and so forth that we enact, this enacted ritual to cut through. And feeding your demons is based on that. It's some, something where we say, no, I'm going to look at this thing. I'm going to go through this process and really work with it, like kind of a good therapy session. And then at other times in our lives, we are in a more empowered place or in a clearer place and we see something arise and we are able to just let it drop, just drop it, just cut through, just drop it and move on. And yet in other times we out in nature and we're sitting and there's a vast view and there are beautiful trees and birdsong and we are not preoccupied with anything at that very moment. And we actually connect, we tap into this vast view and everything feels good and fine. What I was talking to Diane only on. From that place, we know that everything is actually good and okay. Even though, you know, the war is still going on and, you know, injustices and so forth. It's not about, no, it's not bad. It's just okay in that moment because it's all part of the ocean expressing as the ocean. Okay. So um, I'm going to stop there, and uh, I um, yeah I want to thank you for you know subjecting yourself to to going through this process. I hope it was helpful. It sounds like it for um, for some of you or for most of you, hopefully. And um, uh, yeah, it was a wonderful evening with all of you. I wonder is there like a final comment or um, or question um, before we we uh, um, dedicate the merit and close this evening? You know, I think what would be nice is to just sit together. How do how about uh, how about sitting in um, in whatever for you is that place on the mountaintop where you have a view and the, there's some gentle breeze in the trees around or whatever is the basic okayness for you. And so we just become present in our bodies if we're comfortable with that. This is just simple presence in the moment. Just being right where we are in the room, in front of the screen, here we are. Nothing special going on, but we are in this moment. Our attention is in this moment, nowhere else. And then we relax, we let go. For right now, we can let go. In this moment, everything is actually okay. We let go as much as we can. Let go of any holding, even letting go of what we think deep, deep, down, deep down that we should be holding. See if we can even let that go. So the tension is draining out. We're relaxing, We're simply present, letting go. And then there's this suggestion, this notion of space. And we become aware of a spaciousness we don't leave this moment. We don't leave the place we're in. We don't go elsewhere. We just gently let our awareness expand outwards to include everything around us without effort. Just 
everything around us is included. Our awareness is expanding, extending into the world around us. Without any effort, just letting it be, just abiding in the totality of everything. And there we rest, like a mountain or an ocean. Not doing anything, not trying, not striving, just being. From this place, with open-hearted gratitude, let's dedicate the merit of this evening, this time together, any benefit, any benefit, may it stay with us through this week and beyond. And may it go out and benefit those that we come most closely in touch with family, friends, colleagues, and so forth. And then from there, may it go out and benefit all beings everywhere. Imao. Okay. I'm going to just quickly put my... Um, my email in the chat and my wife and my website, which is um, just in case you're interested. Um, we do these teachings called Sky Mind. I'm busy writing a book about that. Um, and then also taramandala.org in case you're more interested in feeding your demons and want to do more of this. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, it was wonderful to see all of you. Good night.